Good morning. Good afternoon to people on the East Coast. Happy start of the National Public Health Week to all attendees. My name is Dr. Vasan Ramachandran. I'm, I'm the Dean of the UT School of Public Health, San Antonio. The theme of National Public Health Week, as you all know, is protecting, connecting, and thriving. We are all public health. When we say that expression, sometimes we forget that the public includes rural America as well. So to start us off for the National Public Health Week, we are centering the margins, if you will, and putting rural health right in front of all of you. We are very fortunate to have an esteemed group of panelists. And I'll begin off by introducing the moderator, who will subsequently introduce the other panelists. Dr. Tyrone Borders is a professor in the College of Nursing at the University of Kentucky. He's a leading expert on rural health services research and policy in our country. Dr. Borders, under doctorate and a master's in health administration, as well as a master's in epidemiology from the University of Iowa, and a bachelor's in psychology from the University of Kansas. He serves as the director of the HRSA funded Rural and Underserved Health Research Center, one of nine rural health research centers funded by HRSA. And he has received funding as a principal investigator from the NIH, from Robert Wood Johnson, from AHRQ. Dr. Borders also serves as the editor of the Journal of Rural Health, which ranks in the top 10 of all health service and policy journals. He has received an outstanding alumni award for career achievement from the University of Iowa College of Public Health. He's an honorary Kentucky colonel and is a fellow of the American College of Epidemiology. It's a real honor and a privilege to welcome you, Dr. Borders, and I'll hand it over to you from here onwards. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice introduction, Dr. Ramachandran. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Let me switch over to my slides here. I'm going to present very briefly some highlights of the state of population health in rural America. I'll be followed by Joe Benitez, who is a assistant professor here at the University of Kentucky. He will be speaking to the changes in insurance coverage, especially Medicaid coverage during the pandemic period. I'll be followed, or Joe will be followed by Andrew Bazemore, who's with the American Board of Family Medicine. Andrew will be speaking about the important contributions of family medicine to primary care and rural access and in, in, in population health in the United States. And then we'll have Peter Caboli, who's director of the Office of Rural Health for the Veterans Health Administration, speaking about rural veterans access. And this is pertinent to rural America because veterans are disproportionately from rural areas and the Veterans Health Administration has been a real leader in new programs and technologies that have improved access to rural citizens. I thought I should begin though by just talking about what we mean by rural versus urban residents. There are many definitions of rural versus urban areas, and these are all based on geopolitical divisions and the number of people who reside in those geopol geopolitical divisions. Probably the most common definition comes from the US Office of Management and Budget, and this map is showing us the rural and urban areas across the United States. I'm using the term rural to refer to non-metropolitan counties, and I'll probably do this uh, interchangeably today, and using the term urban to refer to metropolitan counties. You can see in this map that the darker shaded green areas are metropolitan areas or counties. Typically, these are um, part of metropolitan statistical areas, and they have an urban core in one of those counties that has a, at least 50,000 residents. The other counties are non-metropolitan counties and can be further divided into micropolitan and other non-metropolitan counties. 
The lighter shaded green counties are what we call micropolitan. These have an urban core of 10 to just up to 50,000 persons. And the white shaded counties are other non-metropolitan counties that have an urban core with fewer than 10,000 persons. So if we look here in the San Antonio area where uh, Boston and many persons on the call are located, this of course is part of a metropolitan statistical area. Um, and um, other counties in Texas that are in the white shaded areas are much less densely populated and are other non-metropolitan uh, counties. Overall, about 46 million persons reside in non-metropolitan counties which is about 14% of the overall population. Here's a key indicator of the population health of rural versus urban Americans. We can see that in the late 1960s up until even the 1990s, that the mortality rates, the age-adjusted mortality rates were fairly similar and were declining for rural and urban Americans. However, in the 1990s, there started to be a widening disparity, a gap, and mortality rates that really has continued to expand over time up until the, the later two, 2010s. Of course, around 2019 to 2020, we had the pandemic and mortality rates uh, uh, ticked up a bit because of that. But the main point is that mortality rates uh, continue to be higher among urban than rural, or excuse me, among rural than urban residents. This is showing us the causes of death for rural and urban Americans. And not too surprisingly, the causes of death are fairly similar, regardless of where people live. Heart disease remains the leading cause of death, which of course is of interest to Dr. Rama Chadran and his large rural cohort study. And we, we can look down the list here and see that you know, the typical causes of death are similar again across rural and urban residents. However, the rates are much higher uh, for each of these causes among rural as compared to urban Americans. If we look at the chart on the right-hand side here, this is also showing us some interesting results pertaining to rural population health. We can see that the changes in mortality rates among working age adults differ uh, between metropolitan and non-metropolitan residents. So the drug use over, overdose rate went up over the past 20 years or so among both groups, but went up more among rural Americans. The suicide rate also went up among both groups, but went up much more among rural Americans. Same thing with alcohol-induced mortality rates. If we look down at the bottom bars here though, the total natural cause mortality rates, meaning the, the causes of death on the left-hand side of this, screen, those went down for the most part among metropolitan adults, but went up among non-metropolitan or rural adults. So I think one thing I take away from this is that we need to really think about how we might address these changes in population health among rural versus urban Americans. To this point, quite a bit of the research that we're doing under the Rural and Underserved Health Research Center that we have here at the University of Kentucky does pertain to mental health and substance use treatment issues. So I'm showing this slide for, from some of our work to illustrate what we do, but more importantly, to also illustrate that these issues of access to care are, are rather complex. If we look at the left-hand side here, we can see that the services provided in urban versus rural certified community behavioral health centers differ. Urban centers provide more services for, for particular types, provide more of particular types of services, but rural centers provi provide more of particular types of services that urban-based urban centers don't. So again, it's not necessarily the case that rural areas always have worse of something, sometimes they have more of something. And then the right-hand side here, this is showing us the sources of treatment for depression among persons who met criteria for a major depressive disorder. And again, it's not necessarily the case that access in terms of utilization is worse, but the sources of treatment are different and that rural residents go to see a family physician or other general practice physician more often as compared to a specialist. 
So these are just like a couple of examples of differences in access to care. And today our speakers are going to be pre presenting more information about other dimensions of access that are related to rural Americans population health. Going to hand it over now to my colleague Joe Benitez and let him say a little bit more about himself and the work that he will be presenting. And then let me add that at the end of today's speakers, we'll have plenty of time for discussion and questions from the audience. So Joe. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction and and thank you, Dr. Borders. So um, I'll give it a brief overview of some of the major implications to consider that now that we're in the unwinding um, of states' Medicaid policies that were adopted during the COVID-19 pandemic, also known as the COVID-19 public health emergency. So what many of you know that Medicaid played an outside role in stabilizing healthcare access during the COVID-19 pandemic. And, um, but that, but that role wasn't shared equally across um, urban and rural settings. But so we'll provide an overview of that today. Oops. Okay. So just give you an overview of some of the major things that happened during the pandemic. Uh, at the start of the COVID-19 crisis, the, just prior to uh, the major shutdowns, the unemployment rate was around 3.5%. Shortly after, at the onset of the pandemic, the unemployment rose immediately to 15%, um, just in a short time going from 3.5% unemployment and in February of 2020 to 15% in April of 2020. Now, during the same time, as many people were losing their jobs and um, being forced to give up their employer base or even their private health insurance coverage, um, Medicaid enrollment started to see increasing numbers, so increasing enrollment. So uh, in a short time, uh, Medicaid enrollment increased by about 31%. Uh, up from 71.3 million to 94 million uh, over a three year period. So these enrollment numbers, they're going to reflect um, new enrollees that were new to the Medicaid program, but also um, pre pandemic uh, enrollees who were no longer being disenrolled from Medicaid. So this is where you see there's a continual rise in unemployment. But then we switch over to now that we're in the unwinding and states are unwinding their their Medicaid policy. So resuming their their eligibility determinations and people are being disenrolled from Medicaid. So we see between uh, March uh, or April of 2023 through November of 23, Medicaid enrollment has decreased from eight, 94 million to just under 86 million people enrolled in Medicaid nationally. So one of the natural questions you might ask is, okay, well, where are these people going? Um, are people uh, are people going to other sources of health insurance coverage? Are people becoming uninsured? Um, so what's going on with this population of people? So Medicaid was helpful in uh, bringing the national uninsured rate to an all-time low, largely through the increases in Medicaid enrollments. So people recognizing that they are on Medicaid and using it to stabilize their, their health care needs, particularly after a job loss. Um, the continuous coverage provisions were also helpful, helpful in stabilizing coverage among people who would otherwise be exposed to churn. So people um, becoming momentarily or uh, losing their coverage eligibility because of uh, uh, changes in their income or their eligibility status. So with March 23 being the beginning of the Medicaid unwinding, it allowed states for um, to resume their eligibility determinations and practices and other administrative practices that they had prior to the pandemic. So now through the pandemic was probably the largest disruption in normal economic, economic activities since the Great Recession of 2007 to 2009. And we wanna understand what's what's going on. So these are trends in 
employer-based coverage, uh, private non-group coverage. So private non-group would include uh, marketplace-based coverage. And we also have trends in the share of people that are uninsured as well as the people that are on Medicaid. And these are the trends uh, calculated using the American Community Survey uh, for people in urban settings as well as rural settings. So for employer-based um, coverage, was fairly stable uh, across both uh, both populations of both both groups, but it was declining uh, more so in rural settings, as there were a lot of incentives for marketplace coverage during, that were adopted and implemented during the pandemic, and we started to see increases in in non group coverage more so in the urban uh, areas relative to the 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 rural areas. Uh, we see similar declines in the share of people that report not having any source of health insurance coverage, but we see increases in the share of people that um, have Medicaid coverage at the time that they were interviewed for the for the American Community Survey. But it's happening more more frequently in the rural areas relative to the urban areas. And this brings us to a point that rural areas have generally been more likely to be uninsured as well as dependent on Medicaid for coverage relative to their urban counterparts. Um, now, with the unwinding and many of these people becoming disenrolled from Medicaid, there's mm, about two thirds of people who have already um, been screened uh, for their um, eligibility status nationally. Um, there's still about a third of renewals remaining based on uh, this latest data presented by KFF uh, using uh, Medicaid reporting data from CMS. So about two thirds of renewals re remaining. Uh, there's been about 19 million people who have been disenrolled from Medicaid and uh, about 41 million people who have had their coverage renewed because of procedures. So States varied in when they could start their unwinding activities. Many started in April, some started in May, some started in June, but nationally, um, let's take a look at uh, the trends in, in Medicaid marketplace and the share of people that were uninsured based on the household poll survey. Um, the reason why we wanna highlight marketplace coverage is that many people who are on Medicaid now um, were projected to transition to marketplace coverage. So um, just through from February of 2023 through October, um, there was about a one and a half percentage point uh, drop in the share of people with Medicaid. Uh, no real change in the share of people with marketplace coverage, um, but there was a small, um, relatively negligible, negligible increase in the share of people reporting is uninsured. However, as we start looking at the month by month uh, rollouts of when states start their unwinding activities, the states starting their unwinding activities in April um, saw a bigger drop in Medicaid enrollments uh, and no change in marketplace coverage and a relatively larger increase in the share of people that were uninsured compared to the states that started their unwinding activities later. So for people being unwound from Medicaid, particularly if they're um, in rural settings, they might face more disadvantages relative to their urban counterparts. So um, Medicaid enrollment grew more in, in rural settings relative to urban settings. So um, being separated from Medicaid could create some uh, discontinuities in their access to care and maintaining stable coverage. Um, some of the problems that we're already aware of in the rural settings relative to urban is that there's generally fewer plan fewer ACA based plans available in rural settings. And uh, on top of that, these plans tend to be more expensive. Um, in addition to the plans being more expensive and there being fewer plans available, 
the network participation. So uh, the network of providers, physicians, and other specialists is not as robust in rural plants as it is in more urban plants. Um, so these create some problems with um, what the coverage is actually going to create for or buy them in rural settings relative to the urban settings. Um, the next major concerns for uh, rural uh, or our population in general being unwound for Medicaid is uncertainty about eligibility and maintaining your eligibility status. Um, there's already been a lot of confusion for many states uh, or people in many states about uh, whether they are still eligible and how to maintain their eligibility. Um, and this is on top of uh, some of the burdens that uh, rural residents may face, such as uh, being in, in internet residents, being facing limited access to high-speed internet connections, where they would often provide their materials for uh, maintaining their eligibility status. Um, even those who would go to a uh, face-to-face visit, rural residents would face longer travel distances to Medicaid eligibility offices. And this could be especially uh, problematic for people that are experiencing uh, costly medical conditions or still facing uh, potential long COVID complications and otherwise still on Medicaid. So um, that wraps up uh, my brief presentation. I'm looking forward to our discussion at the end. And uh, uh, thank you for including me in this. All right, thank you, Joe. And we'll continue on now with uh, Andrew Bazemore's presentation. Sorry, I was having trouble as I boosted it getting off mute there, Ty. Thank you. Uh, I'm hoping that the presentation is uh, showing now, though. And I really appreciate uh, the opportunity today to present and to join National Public Health Day. Um, I was asked to share some brief thoughts specifically on the contributions of primary health care uh, around access population, health inequity, and, you know, should should start with a little bit about my background coming uh, not only as the um, a representative of the American Board of Family Medicine, but I uh, specifically having been engaged in a medical career with a public health mindset. Um, I was raised in a medium-sized city, but my parents were both from small towns in North Carolina. I certainly witnessed and had a lot of formative experience as a child about the challenges that rural health uh, faces and was a witness early on through work in rural Bolivia, which helped shape my decision to choose med school, um, about how crucial that primary care public health integration is, particularly in rural communities and places that have the least resources and the greatest needs. Specifically, was working uh, with indigenous Quechua speaking populations and learned a term called community-oriented primary care where the primary care vision that we too often see here, something that is basic and is done as a box uh, in an outpatient setting, um, isn't sufficient to capture that essential function of primary care. COPC would say primary care has to integrate community medicine, has to be systemic and coordinated, has to bring together knowledge of nutrition, sanitation, maternal and infant mortality reduction, uh, immunizations, disease control, as well as that frontline clinical care. And in working in community health centers, both urban and rural uh, in the United States, getting to, to witness how optimized essential primary health care can impact uh, rural communities was very shaping for me. Uh, and in the educational sense, although I was at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, seeing how area health education centers that brought together whole teams, not just physicians, um, nurses, uh, community health workers, and others into learning in single spaces uh, for rural communities was quite shaping. And what it really uh, impressed upon me was that this declaration of Alma Ata back in 1978 by all the nations of the world that, that said primary health care is essential health care based on practical, scientifically sound, socially acceptable methods and technology, but it's something that's universally accessible and accessed it's something that involves engagement and participation and cost at a reasonable level. And if it's done well, this should be the central function of these communities, and particularly rural communities, and should help their social and economic development. And yet what we actually see, despite an abundance of evidence, is low investment in primary care. Five to seven cents of every healthcare dollar, even though this is the most widely distributed, as Ty has noted earlier, uh, point of contact with the healthcare system. 
Uh, we had 25 years of seminal work from Johns Hopkins' Barbara Starfield and laying out evidence that established how communities, counties, and nations that emphasize strong primary care had longer lives and higher quality at, uh, at lower cost. More recently, Sanjay Besu and company have modeled what the association is between primary care physician presence and team presence uh, by proxy with population mortality. They've been able to show that uh, for every 10 additional PCPs, primary care physicians added into these rural counties and communities, you can see drops in mortality that are not only tangible, but measurable as much as 51 days. They could not find similar measurements when they looked at uh, hospital and specialty presence, although those are critical, but you have to have these primary care teams if you're going to uh, bend that curve. And if we're going to get those teams, since rural primary care seems to be in a, a state of perpetual shortage, can't stress enough the importance of rural training, of actually having rural exposure. We've known for years that rural born and rural graduated leads to more rural presence in the workforce. That's across all healthcare disciplines and public health disciplines. But along the way, we have to have that exposure. Working with an Australian colleague, Dr. Deborah Russell, we were actually able to show that you could measure this and that you know when you see the difference between um, high and low exposure, you can see an association between rural uh, training during family medicine residency and a five to six fold increase in subsequent rural practice with a positive dose effect. I'd go back and show you how with more and more exposure and more training, one sees an association with more and more rural presence downstream. And yet we could demonstrate also that less than 10% of our grads from a national comprehensive survey had any rural exposure during their training. But there is good news. Uh, we're seeing in a transition to single accreditation and with the Health Resources and Services Administration funding more tracks, rural training tracks, and more flavors of rural, a rise in rural exposure and rural training. And it's not just these tracks, these one-year, two-year programs where you start in a larger city and move to a more remote area. Uh, it's even urban programs that are what we call rural-facing, making sure that, um, for example, in Missoula, Montana, uh, while you may be based out of a moderate-sized city, you're getting, in some cases, as much as 30 to 50% of your, uh, your training exposure in much smaller towns and seeing uh, most of their grads end up in rural. Um, if you look at a recent report from the National Academies of Medicine on primary care, it really highlights the pressing problems facing primary care at large, but those that are magnified and amplified in rural settings, the need to desperately change payment structures so that we're paying for primary care teams that care for people not just doctors caring for services uh, and delivering services, ensuring that uh, this is something that is available to every individual and family in every community at a time when we can actually document uh, less than one in five Americans can say, this is my personal relationship with my primary care clinician. That We need to train the primary care teams where they're um, uh, the people that we want to serve are living and working. And this could be more true uh, for rural settings. We need more of these rural training tracks and even urban-based uh, rural-facing programs. And we've got to design the technology, the information infrastructure uh, to make a difference there. What I saw in Bolivia uh, with household-level data collection in a community with very, very few resources is rarely seen in the wealthiest um, uh, nation on the planet right here at home. And finally, we have to stop talking about it. We have to assure that it's implemented. And again, what we're talking about is not something basic. We're not talking about uh, something that we can simplify and downgrade. We're talking about a primary health care that delivers on not only Barbara Starfield's original four C's, by which she said we can explain primary care's positive effects on health, really a seven C's where uh, you see rural Americans and all Americans finding first contact uh, with primary care. They're having continuous caring relationships. They see a comprehensive team, one that can take care of most of their needs and refer them only for the things that are really urgent, particularly when those referrals are uh, at a distance and with great cost. They're coordinators. They recognize that uh, care has to be patient-centered and that if you're going to actually meet the needs of a rural America, it has to be community engaged. And that means truly engaged. I love the community health center model, having worked in three where 51% of your governing board have to come from the community that you serve, really reflect your patients. And finally, working with an eye for complexity science, ruralists in particular in primary care recognize that problems don't walk in wearing a label. 
and they're often extremely complex and requiring uh, need for attention to upstream factors, to behavioral as well as physical health factors. And finally, if we're going to uh, service these needs, we've got to keep in mind four T's. Rural primary health care needs to be operationalized in teams. Those include information scientists, community health workers, behaviorists, NPs, PAs, uh, assistants, uh, dental care and allied health, taking advantage fully of tools and technology. It's amazing uh, what I witness, whether working uh, at home or abroad in rural America, the power of clinical teams that have uh, telehealth apps, point of care ultrasound, really changing the game for access and equity, uh, starting to embrace biometrics and genomics in ways that we couldn't before, using tools and measurement like patient-centered primary care measures, um, registries, predictive analytics. I think the world of artificial intelligence and machine learning, while it will likely come to primary care last, as so many technologies do, has actually the greatest potential impact for rural populations being served by primary care. And finally, making sure that this care is tailored that it uh, reaches those with substance abuse and opioid use disorder, recognizes the growing uh, blight of OB and maternity care deserts at the time we're seeing U.S. Mat uh, maternal and child uh, and infant mortality rise, um, that is sensitive to and aware of as good primary care training allows us to be social determinants and upstream care, operationalizes this community-oriented primary care model, and recognizes that we have to meet people where they are from different backgrounds if we're going to deliver equitable rural primary care. I think I should note uh, from our research that if you look, uh, getting back to that idea of public health primary care integration, the place where it's already happening most, it is rural. Our research, uh, again, across this comprehensive survey of family physicians is showing that it's more frequent to see interactions between public health and primary care in small rural and frontier rural places. 72 and 80 percent of family physicians reporting that they were working with local public health officials. As a matter of fact, you're not unlikely to find a family physician in many rural counties serving as a chief public health officer and working in outpatient ER and in, uh, in hospital settings at the same time. I think perpetually disturbing to me is um, having worked in global settings with far less resources is the dearth of uh, those that are granted to these public health primary care partnerships. I worked a decade ago in North Carolina with the state Medicaid office and some federal funding to build out uh, with community cares, a geospatial platform that allows you to link Medicaid data, population health data, work with 14 statewide teams going in peer to peer and able to say, all right, these are the counties in rural Western North Carolina with the highest rates of asthma, smoking, uh, lowest, lowest likelihood of following National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute guidelines for their care, and really target how can we improve these all the way down to the office level, bringing in public health and primary care together. And despite saving over $250 million a year in the first study of this program, it's amazing how when political winds shift and privatization moves in, these can fall apart in very short order. Again, when we get back to the low investment in this robust vision for primary care, five to seven cents on the healthcare dollar, it's abundantly clear that if we're going to change rural health through public health primary care integration, it's going to take greater investment. And thank you, Ty. Thanks, Andrea. Peter? Okay. Uh, sorry. There we go. We'll still get it. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Peter Caboli. I'm the uh, Executive Director of the VA Office of Rural Health. Pleasure to be here today. I have eight slides, so it'll take me about eight minutes to get through this. Um, what I want to talk about is how the VA um, views rural health. And I understand it's rural, it's public health week, but it's, you know, we look at both the public health and the healthcare side of things and how we address the challenges. And I think getting Building off what um, Andrew said about, you know, stop talking about it and what are we going to do about it? I'm going to focus on the doing part. So next slide. So just to give a little background of, of VA, um, if you look in the middle, there are about 18 million veterans. So roughly 5% of the U.S. population is a veteran. And of those, a little more than a little under half are enrolled. But if you click to the next slide, you'll see on the left hand side that uh, rural veterans actually enroll in VA at a higher rate. So we re they represent about 24% of all veterans, but 61% of rural veterans are enrolled in care. And we say that because it means that rural veterans actually disproportionately um, depend on the VA for health care. 
Uh, there's a number of reasons for that. One is that oftentimes there isn't another form of care in the community that they live in. And so driving that extra 30, 60, 90 minutes to a VA is actually just as if, as far as if they went to get other uh, care. Next slide. When we look at it by state, we like to point out that every state has a rural population. Um, what this map shows is the darker the blue, the greater proportion of veterans are rural. So if you look at Montana, if you click the next slide and get a little arrow. If you look at Montana, oh, there's Florida and there's Montana. Yep. So if you look at Montana, you know, over 70% of the veteran population that lives in Montana lives in a rural area. But the number is actually only around 20,000. Whereas you look at a state like Florida has over 100,000 rural veterans because it's a large state with a large population. Um, so, you know, we try to tailor things to the location, to the region. There are different uh, needs in different areas. And we look at rural um, at, in that heterogeneous uh, view. Next slide. So we're going to come back to this slide at the very end to wrap things up and talk about how we address rural uh, challenges across these four domains. So these are all common to everybody. We understand what the issues are, but we're going to talk about how we address workforce and how you deal with shortages and recruitment retention, geography, how you overcome geography through transportation, telemedicine, uh, the digital divide, and, and both on the the patient side of whether they can even access broadband and what are the services that we can provide. The larger or the other bucket is the social determinants of health, which uh, could be a whole nother uh, conversation by itself. Next slide. So our budget is about $300 million a year. Uh, and we use our funds to leverage uh, new innovations in care. We now have programs across all 140 plus medical centers and over a thousand VA clinics. Uh, we do this through what we call enterprise-wide initiatives, and these are programs that are across the whole uh, VA um, that can anybody can participate in or a facility can participate in. We have things called promising practice. I'll give you some examples. And then we have five regional rural health centers, resource centers that are in Portland, Salt Lake City, Iowa City, uh, and Gainesville, and um, uh, White River Junction, Vermont. So of our enterprise-wide initiatives, I'm just going to point out a couple because I can't go through all of them. If you start at the top left, under primary care, we have a new one this year. It has a great acronym, SCOUTS. Basically, it's using telehealth techs. I'm sorry, it's using intermediate care technicians. Oftentimes, these are medics from the military who can then be hired right in to work in an ER setting and go into the communities that they're serving um, and they're focused on rural communities. <laughs> Under specialty care, we've hired hundreds of pharmacists over the last number of years to focus on specific conditions, but also just to bolster the clinical pharmacy services that we provide, both in person and by telemedicine. And we have a whole host of telemedicine programs, everything from neurology as an example and telestroke, where we provide 24-hour stroke care uh, by a stroke neurologist. Uh, and a novel cardiology program where we're coordinating the care of rural veterans to get into procedures that are usually elective, like TAVRs or um, uh, uh, angioplasties that they can be scheduled for, but coordinating that care. Another really unique one is at the bottom left there, this mobile prosthetics and orthotics care this is a program actually where, you know, mobile clinics and anybody's dealt with a mobile clinic, know there's, there's, there's a lot of challenges with mobile clinics, but this one actually doesn't provide care inside the mobile unit. It brings the mobile unit to a rural clinic to provide an orthotist and, or, or a prosthetist <clears throat> to provide the care using the tools and supplies that they carry with them. So they're like, they bring the service to the veteran. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through the other ones, but we cover mental health workforce training and education, number of innovations, and uh, a whole program on resource hubs. Next slide. Uh, we have these uh, programs out of our resource centers, and I just have a handful here to just show the breadth. I wanna just focus on two of them. Um, Advanced Comprehensive Diabetes Care, I just like because I think it has the best acronym ever for a program uh, as ACDC, but it provides telemedicine for diabetes care 
uh, into small clinics that don't have diabetes specialists or diabetes uh, nurse educators. And the other one is home-based cardiac rehabilitation. This is a program we started about 50, almost 15 years ago now, and it's spread across the country and has actually changed the way cardiac rehab is provided in rural settings, even outside the VA. Next slide. Okay, so to wrap up here, when we talk about workforce, one of the things that we look for in the VA is the supply and the demand. You know, people always say we don't have enough primary care providers in rural areas. That, that's true overall, but what we find in the VA, we have enough providers in total, we just don't have them in the right places. So we have too many in some areas and not enough in others. And using telehealth, we're able to level that field a bit. Uh, I think the other area is training and incentives. Like Andrew said, we know one of the biggest predictors is somebody from a rural area is more likely to practice in a rural area. So how do we get them into the pipeline? Uh, next slide. Or click to the next. You just go ahead and click all the way. There we go. S social determinants of health. Um, one thing the VA has an opportunity to use are uh, uh, housing urban development vouchers that we, well, that are designated for veterans. So getting them into these uh, housing voucher programs. The other thing is building a local healthcare system. It is critical that we work with, work with uh, rural sites of care to make sure there's home care, skilled care, and long-term care in these areas. Another that I'm sure this group is very familiar with are critical access and rural emergency hospitals. Uh, we know that over 80% of veterans actually get their acute care in these in rural areas in non-VA hospitals. So it's uh, incumbent upon us to work with them. And lastly, telehealth is the big um, uh, equalizer in a lot of ways. It doesn't cover everything, but we've been pushing telehealth as much as we can. And lastly, with broadband, uh, we know that about 95% of uh, veterans, both rural and urban, actually have access to uh, broadband. But there are other challenges. There are some areas that, that they just can't afford it um, and others that just choose not to use it. So we don't want to... Uh, precipitate, or I should say, make worse the digital divide. So those are the ways that we have, have addressed uh, the challenges of rural health care, and I'll stop there. Thank you. All right. Thank you uh, all for these really enlightening presentations and really provided you know, background about the importance of Medicaid and financial uh, mechanisms for ensuring access and the role of primary care providers especially family physicians and uh, ensuring access to primary care and their relationship to public health overall. And then also, as I mentioned, the innovative means that the VA is, is engaged in to improve access to care and then ultimately population health. At this point, we're going to take present questions from the audience. And given that there are over 100 people who are tuned in, I think probably the best thing to do is to put your question to the chat and I can read that aloud. And if somebody wants to, you know, if somebody's okay with that, I, well, I'll assume you're okay with that. I'll mention your name. And then if you want to have a follow-up question verbally, then that would be uh, perfectly fine, if that makes sense. All right, so I'll wait some Questions from the chat here. Oops. Well, while we're waiting, I'm going to ask a question if I can. I'd like of to course. ask one of you, Joe. You know, one of the things you talked about was the, you know, the unwinding and, and you know, clarifying who's going to be on or eligible for Medicaid, you know, post pandemic. Is there still an opportunity or any movement on states that did not expand Medicaid to decide to do it? Or is that sort of a political non-starter in some areas and just is not, not gonna happen? Yeah, I would say, um, so I would agree that there's probably some uh, political opposition towards expanding uh, Medicaid, although we're starting to see uh, different uh, types, uh, alternatives to Medicaid expansion. So let's take Georgia, for example, who is uh, in the early stages of their pathways to uh, coverage programs. So rather than uh, the 
traditional Medicaid expansion, which was implemented under the Affordable uh, Care Act. Um, uh, Georgia's pathway is raising the, um, the eligibility limit to cover a smaller share of lower income persons. Uh, so smaller than if they would have adopted the full Medicaid expansion. And also they're including a work requirement. So at this point, there's 10 states that have not expanded Medicaid under the ACA. I would say the, the, the door is open to, uh, to expand Medicaid for these remaining states. And uh, let's see, among them, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, Texas, um, uh, South Carolina, and uh, I can't remember the, the remaining states, but um, th I would say there's still an uh, opportunity to expand Medicaid and think about um, what Medicaid expansion could do for your remaining poor in terms of improving access to care. Um, one of the, in, in it's like Ty uh, had mentioned, uh, as far as possible financing, um, one of the things that we know from Medicaid expansion is that um, in addition to providing direct care coverage for or access for the people gaining coverage, it helps uh, rural hospitals stay more financially viable um, by improving their, their financial health as people are now able to um, use Medicaid for their coverage rather than uh, be dependent on, um, say, disproportional share hospital payments, for example, or um, any care that would be um, unpaid for. Um, so sorry if I sorry if I rambled or went over, but thank you. Right, we have uh, several uh, interesting questions here in the chat, and one from David Miramontes, and uh, it asks, "What initiatives are being done in rural in the rural environment for opioid use disorder?" And I might. I might respond to that. Quite a bit of our work here at Kentucky, and mine included, uh, pertains to the treatment of opioid use disorder and access to drug use treatment in general. And of course, one of the the one of the the things that we do have for treating opioid use disorder is, in fact, medication, meaning buprenorphine. The the if you look at the, the number of people that are prescribing buprenorphine nationally. It's, there, I think there's pretty good access to, to this treatment across rural and urban America, although there may be in some areas of the U.S. where there's less access to buprenorphine than others. Um, but that said, you know, I think it's, I think it's in the, the overall picture of drug use treatment that we've tackled this better than we have certainly other types of drug use disorders. That said, there's still some questions about the degree to which there might be some barriers among you know, individual physician practices or nurse practitioner practices, et cetera, in terms of whether they, you know, how much they're really prescribing this and also continue to reluctance to seek treatment. Because we know the vast majority of people that actually have a drug use disorder never get treatment at all. Um, let's see. Did you want to follow up anybody on that? To, you know, Ty, just say, uh... Circling this back to the primary care setting, um, we have seen major statewide and county and regional initiatives to expand MAT uh, in the primary care setting. I mean, this is one of many spaces where if you can fully empower these small rural primary care teams, um, you have the you have the ground game. You have certainly uh, the presence in more areas than anywhere else. Telemedicine, telehealth have been such important factors. Um, for expanding telepsych, online counseling, digital platforms for MAT, and then even things like the Provider Clinical Support Network or, or PCSS uh, with free training and mentoring for those primary care uh, clinician teams that are willing to get involved with substance use disorders. And finally, a lot of uh, uh, partnerships with local and state health departments to get out more naloxone uh, and get more primary care clinicians trained and ready to deliver, um, uh, you know, again, reversibility there. So the next question um, pertains to the VA, but you know I've heard something similar pop up here and you know, just at our uh, university medical center. Does the VA use a specific system to track external specialist social determinants of health referrals to ensure a closed loop 
process occurs? So I'd say answer that in two ways. So one is, so the VA just adopted over the last uh, six, eight months, uh, the ACORN screening tool um, modified slightly, but essentially doing the screening for social determinant health um, questionnaire that, that the ACORN provides. And, you know, one of the challenges to deciding to do it is, well, you can screen, but you got to be able to do something about it. What we find is that most of the referrals for that are all within our own system, whether it's, you know, uh, counseling or social worker, uh, whether it's internal programs that provide help with food insecurity. So I think we do most of it internally. In terms of the closed loop outside, it's the challenge that every health system has if you don't share a common medical record. You know, you're um, unfortunately stuck with fax, telephone, and um, uh, the, the patient themselves being responsible for closing the loop. And it's, it, that is definitely a problem. All right, I think we have a couple of questions from Jonathan Williams and sure, sure. let me see if I can kind of state the first one. Uh, pertains to Medicare Advantage in rural communities and value-based healthcare models of reimbursement that perhaps could be discouraged by critical access hospitals and rural health clinics. Um, are we addressing the evolution of Medicare reimbursement models, but then the rural community? Let's see. Uh, does anybody want to try to respond to that before I do? <laughs> okay. Um, there's Jonathan popping up here. So I think that, you know, thinking about critical access hospitals and the fact that they receive cost-based reimbursement from Medicare, you know, in a sense, you're right that you know, they don't have the financial incentive to engage in other types of models that really are value-based. And, you know, this is one of the criticisms of the critical access hospital model is that you know, it is based on, you know, Re hospitals are, these hospitals are reimbursed on the services that they provide in a cost-based mechanism. And, uh, you know, is there what's going to be done to try to change that? I'm not sure there's anything really in, in the works that will incentivize value-based provision of, of medical care by critical access hospitals, you know, in the near term, in part because there's this concern about, and I think there's another question related to this about, you know, the maintaining the financial um, stability of rural hospitals to help make sure that they don't close. But anyway, did we, so something in more detail we might, might be able to elaborate on, Jonathan? Yeah, so hopefully you can hear me okay. Sure. Great. Uh, yeah, so one of the things is in the legislation, of course, that does the value-based health care, it's a natural redirective of funding towards primary care. I think we all understand that if you're looking at the model. And so the problem is, is if you're looking at the rural community as being a primary site and recipient for a, a needed increase in primary care funding, and if Medicare being one of the primary means by which the federal government is going to effectively help transition or fund some of that primary care, this is a huge obstacle to actually implementing that change in the rural counties, in the rural communities. And, and literally Torch, for instance, within the state of Texas is actively working against the adoption of this. The home health services work against the adoption of this because of this increased accountability, also bringing in the additional payer sources. Again, every patient that is transitioning from standard Medicare fee-for-service to a value-based model represents a potential loss of income, revenue, and control to a very limited uh, uh, rural health uh, infrastructure. And so Obviously, from my standpoint, we're going to have to do something to find an alternate form of funding from the original cost-based or value-based health care is destined to not work in uh, these rural communities, at least not for the time being. Ty, Ty, I'm, I think I'm Jonathan, hoping some of you guys are fixing that. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, I think uh, Jonathan's uh, sharing from Texas what we're 
certainly hearing from all over. And, it, and if you don't have um, some real work on getting high reimbursements that can help to, to restore that balance for critical access hospitals, rural health clinics, I, I completely agree, but it's going to take time. It's going to take patients with pilot programs, demonstrations, Further supportive collaborative networks, you know, incentives to join ACOs, uh, more technical assistance if you're going to create this um, uh, this transition, and then some real education and training initiatives. Um, I think there's a lot of mystification of value based payment, and now a lot of skepticism. Um, so I, I would completely agree. It's going to take a combination of all those things and some patience, or you're going to see this um, uh, wither rather than grow. Thank you, Andrew. And, uh, and I'll, I'll by the way, you're great. I'll, I'll add from the, the a couple things from the VA perspective, and it's, and certainly you know value based payment is mystifying. And uh, um, someday when somebody can explain it to me that I can fully understand it, I'd be glad to hear it. You know, I think on the VA side, you know, we actually have calculated that we spend about nine percent of our total budget on primary care, and you know I, I would argue that that's a pretty good number. And I think if in our our national health care, you know, our system overall, if we could move that dial from five to 7% to closer to 9%, I think that would make a difference. It's just that, you know, I don't have the levers to move that and I don't know who does, but uh, uh, hopefully after this call, somebody gets a great idea how to move that up. Just a couple percentage points would actually make a big difference, like like Andrew said. I'm not asking for 20%, just another 2%. Yeah. <laughs> I think we may have time for one more question and answer. And I, there are a couple that are sort of related. One comes from Dr. Ramachandran. It says lots of innovative measures to impact rural health disparities while rural or urban differences are escalating. How do we ensure the pace of change in rural health care delivery matches the growing divide in mortality rates? And what is the role of hospital grade care being delivered closer to homes as rural hospitals are shuttering? And, um, I think we've heard today about some strategies that could improve access. I might just take a might quickly comment about the hospital closure issue. And I, uh, you know, there there are hospital closures occurring across the U.S. This gets a lot of attention. I think that the thing we have to consider is can we really um, do we really have the economies of scale in some of these communities to continue to support our hospital? And the reality is probably in many cases, no. So therefore we have to look for other means and whatever they are to try to shore up access to the extent that we can. But in some cases, people will simply have to travel to you know, other areas for services. But the, the rest of our panel probably has some thoughts about how we, how we try to you know, attenuate some of these widening disparities and mortality, et cetera. I think quickly, um, having been a student of telemedicine from global health days for two decades, I've always been astonished how slow the pace of adoption was in primary care and primary care rural. But boy, um, from Obama administration era uh, measures to expand rural bandwidth through the president and then a pandemic, you know, the door just it it finally swung open and we're watching in our national surveys telemedicine kind of retreat to something that's well in advance of what it was in 2019, but but still shy of what it could be. So as we see, first of all, we have to just slow down some of these closures, but we're going to have to make this up with expanded telehealth telemedicine services. We've had lots of experiences and experiments with mobile health clinics, community paramedicine with paramedics. Uh, we've had a lot of financing over the last 10 years to bring uh, real integrated delivery into the primary care setting. Um, and you can really enhance that when you don't have to have teaming as purely present, but with virtual care and telemedicine, you can uh, mm -hmm. move forward. We really just need the policy, as we've said repeatedly, uh, the policy support and the funding support to keep advancing these because the technology and the bandwidth are finally there. And there is a you know an acceptance of many of these experiments. They just need to be scaled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I know we're almost out of time, but I, I'll add to that, uh, you know, the programs like Hospital at Home, which I get a lot, which get a lot of excitement, you know, I'm just not excited about in rural areas, there's just too much distance, you know, for a team to go into the home, but there is a lot that can be done with telemedicine, you know, especially early discharges of patients to get them back to their home, to heal at home, and provide you know, maybe not hospital level care, 
but uh, what they need in the home um, as long as there's local resources. And the other thing I'd say about closures, uh, you know, Iowa is a state that hasn't had a closure in 15 years. And that's because we expanded Medicaid, I think. I'm not saying it's cause and effect, but if you overlap the map of hospital closures in states that didn't expand Medicaid, it's pretty telling. Well, I think we're, we'll probably wrap it up here. I'm gonna allow Dr. Ramachandran to uh, have a closing thought or, or, or two. A lot of gratitude to the esteemed panelists. We had a lively discussion and I could see from the speed of questions that we could be here for a long time, but I appreciate the care for rural health. I appreciate who are uh, close to 125 people who attended for the hour. Let's all work together to change the health care and health in rural America and kudos to our panelists for leading that effort. Thank you all. Thank you.